on where you are joining us from today. Uh, this is actually an exciting moment for the British Association for International and Comparative Education uh, in terms of launching its international webinar series, which are promoted at uh, which are aimed at promoting global conversations related to various aspects of international and comparative education. Um, Jack Lee from the University of Edinburgh, uh, who is here today, and myself, Dilrabo Jonbekova from Nazarbayev University, are coordinators of the BASE International Webinar Series. So if you have any questions or suggestions, please do get in touch with us. Uh, I will post our email addresses in a few minutes in the chat box. Um, so uh, the topic of this first webinar is the impact of COVID-19 on uh, education. And we are very pleased to have an exciting set of presentations from a number of contexts and from various institutions. Our first uh, speaker today is Matthew Easterbrook, senior uh, lecturer in psychology from the University of Sussex. Our second speaker will be Noreen Durrani, uh, professor of education at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. And our third speakers are three colleagues from UNESCO, and these are uh, Emma Sabzaliva, the head of research and policy analysis unit, and Dana Abdrasheva and Mauricio Escribens, who are both policy analysts uh, at UNESCO. Uh, we are equally honored to have Professor Ricardo Sabate from the University of Cambridge, who is also a member of BASE Executive uh, Committee, who will lead uh, the discussion and Q&A segment of today's webinar. Uh, before we begin, let me take you uh, through the protocol of our uh, webinar first. Uh, kindly note that the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on uh, BASE website and on BASE YouTube channel within the next uh, two days. During the webinar, please try to keep yourself muted so that we can avoid uh, any background noise. Um, there is no requirement to turn on your video unless you wish to do so. Um, to ask a question or provide a comment, we do have substantial Q&A segment, uh, which will begin after all of our speakers present. So please place your questions in the chat box or you can uh, ask it directly after the presenters are done with their presentations. We are all very much looking forward uh, to today's presentations, and we begin now uh, with Matthew. Matthew, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. I'll uh, just share my screen. Is that okay? Can you see that okay? Yeah. Yes, Great. we can see that. Okay, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I really look forward to the discussions today. Having an international perspective on this will be really interesting. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about some work we did during the first series of lockdowns in the UK. Where we did a survey. Um, I'm actually a social psychologist, so um, I will be talking a bit about some of the more social psychological factors towards the end of the presentation as well. Okay, so a bit of context is that UK schools were mandated to close around the 20th of March 2020. Um, and they remain closed for pupils, um, all pupils except those of key workers, so those that are deemed to be essential to running society and economy, and those who are uh, identified as being vulnerable, which is usually special educational needs and disabilities. Some schools closed before that if they had an outbreak of COVID, um, but all were closed from the 20th of March until at least the 1st of June, and then they started to reopen often with additional measures, so with social distancing in place, with hand washing and learning bubbles, and often schools ended up closing again if there was an outbreak of COVID among teachers or pupils, so it was quite a disruptive period even after they started to reopen. Now during this time we got some funding from the European Association of Social Psychology, um, Higher Education Innovation Fund, and um, the Impact Acceleration Account from ESRC to do a survey among parents and teachers, which we launched on the 5th of May and it ran until the 21st of July 2020, so during the time when schools were closed and during the time when they were reopening again before the end of the academic year. Most of the recruitment was through social media advertisements. You can see the page, the Facebook page at the top of the slide, 
We did a lot of um, Twitter campaigning as well, and we had a booster sample of low socioeconomic status um, parents and an ethnic minority booster from academic prolific. Unfortunately, our sample of ethnic minorities was small, so um, we can't delve into anything there. Unfortunately, obviously, that is a big flaw in this, and we need to investigate that further in the future. Still, we ended up with over three and a half thousand parents who completed this survey and over 2000 teachers. They answered slightly different questions, um, all about the home learning experience and what schools were providing during the lockdown. And they represent 2,752 unique school, schools across the UK. Mostly they're from England, 85% from England. Um, we do have some from Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. 60% uh, primary schools, 81% of mothers, vast majority, not surprising. 95% uh, of the schools were state schools. So 5% were independent fee-paying private schools. Now only about 7% of the population go to fee-paying private schools, so it's not that much of a uh, warped sample. But we still have a decent enough sample to look at this. And this really is one of the main drivers of inequality that we see in our data. So I'm going to be talking about this to some extent. So first of all, I wanna delve into some of the things that teachers were telling us about what actually happened during the first stages of the lockdown. And I think one of the simplest ways to describe this is just to look at the answers to this. <laughs> When did they first start providing educational materials to support learning from home? Now, we know that the schools were mandated to close on the 20th of May, which you can see highlighted here. If we look at when state schools provided the first uh, provisions, it varied from just before, so the 14th of March, usually that's because they had an outbreak of COVID beforehand. But some of the schools were telling us they didn't provide any educational materials until the 8th of June. So two and a half months, some pupils went without any educational support at all. So there's a vast uh, variation in how able state schools were to quickly react to this. And so the educational experience of pupils at home um, was vastly different. If we look at independent schools, some of them started to provide materials towards the beginning of the month, again, usually because COVID was an uh, outbreak in their school, and the very latest was the 20th of April, so just a range uh, one month later than the official lockdown. So we're already seeing that there are stark inequalities between state schools and fee-paying in independent schools in terms of how quickly they were able to get the support in place. Now, if we delve into some of the things that teachers were telling us, a lot of independent schools already provided some form of virtual learning, so they had infrastructure in place often that they could then reuse and repackage to support home learning. They had teachers who are familiar with using those kind of softwares. That vastly seeded things up. State schools often prioritised providing more pastoral support and making sure free school meals were available to their pupils. But they also found... Um, they were reluctant to impose some forms of home learning, like video interaction, for instance, because there was quite a lot of concerns about safeguarding issues. So maybe this is a lack of information about the legality uh, and the safeguarding rules. Uh, and that really, some state schools just decided not to try to do video interactive learning because um, they were worried about the safeguarding issues. Um, so we also see differences in the proportion of pupils that teachers estimated were Accessing all of the home learning materials. 94% of students at independent schools were estimated to be accessing, and about 87% completing all of the materials. Um, and we see inequalities um, so that state schools was accessing about 70% of their pupils were accessing, um, and about 58% were completing all of the work. Now, We've done some additional analyses here to look at the types of things that schools were providing during lockdown. Um, and also using some of the parent responses, we've been able to estimate how strongly these things are associated with the time that pupils spent home learning. 
And to give you a baseline, in our survey responses, we see that the average among primary school pupils, they were spending about three hours a day on home learning materials, somewhere between one and four, but the average is about three. In secondary school, the average is 4.3 hours. Most were between three and five hours. So that's sort of a baseline that we can use to judge how impactful these different provisions were. So if we look at providing feedback on work, over 90% of fee-paying schools did this, um, and just over 60% of state schools, so large differences. And this is important because um, schools that provided feedback on their students' work, uh, their students were likely to spend an extra 19 minutes a day for primary school and an extra half an hour a day for secondary school students. So that provision of feedback is associated with more time spent learning the materials and engaging with home learning. We look at interactions with teachers. This goes back to what I was saying about some of the safeguarding issues. Um, almost all independent schools did, 95%, whereas less than 40% of state schools managed to provide interactions with teachers. This could be text or it could be um, video interactions. And this seemed to be particularly important for country school students. Um, it's associated with an extra 32 minutes of home learning a day, uh, 18 minutes for primary school. Interactions with peers, again, very stark differences, about 88% among independent schools, less than 20% for state schools. This is particularly important for primary school pupils. So we know that you know, play and peer interactions are very important for primary school pupils, and that's reflected here. They were spending an extra 32 minutes a day on home learning materials if they could interact with their peers compared to 14 or, um, secondary school pupils. Now, a schedule for the day, parents valued this high. They wanted their children to have a schedule or structure to their day. Roughly 50% um, across the schools provided this, but it was very important for student engagement, plus 25 and plus 29 minutes a day um, for primary and secondary schools, respectively. And uh, something that really kind of uh, shows the importance of differentiating between school children, so up to about age 11, and then secondary school pupils who are up to you know, 16, 17, 18, was the ability to submit work. It had no impact on primary school pupils, how engaged they were with the materials, but it was associated with an extra 50 minutes among secondary school pupils, so really important. Um, almost all independent schools did that, um, just under 80% of state schools. So we can see here that there are pretty large inequalities based on the type of school. If it's fee paying, they're more likely to do these engaging materials. Um, among primary school pupils, interacting with peers and having that ability to see your friends was really important. Among second, the ability to submit work uh, and interacting with your teachers and providing feedback was associated with the increase in time spent. Now, if we focus on parents, we can look at some inequalities based on student pupil characteristics. Pupils who are eligible for free school meals or not compared to their peers. So this is an indicator of economic disadvantage. Um, they were doing about 48 minutes less per day among primary school pupils and 36 minutes less a day for secondary school pupils. Now you can think of how much that accumulates over time. It's a vast inequality in the time spent home learning. Pupils whose parents had not graduated from university compared to those who had, we see a gap of 22 minutes in primary school, 18 minutes in secondary school, so slightly less than the economic one. Uh, and we see the reverse pattern for gender. So boys did 11 minutes less on average a day in primary school, 24 minutes a day less in secondary. All right, so some of the things that we wanted to do with this survey was to explore some of the reasons why certain pupils found home learning more challenging than others. So we measured a range of things about the home environment. So all of a sudden, education was shifted into the home. So we wanted to measure, you know, is there problems with having insufficient internet, a lack of technology, so a lack of laptops, iPads, maybe you have to share it with your siblings, maybe you have to use your smartphone, a lack of space, and having a noisy home environment. We also wanted to measure parental supervision because suddenly parents are expected to be involved in their children's education more so than usual. So we measured their knowledge, confidence, and motivation to supervise, labeled here as ability, and the amount of time that they could dedicate to supervising their children's work. We see differences, but based 
different indicators of socioeconomic status. So if your pupil was eligible for free school meals, it was the home environment that made learning from home more challenging. So they were more to report a lack of internet and a lack of technology made home learning more challenging, a lack of space, and having a noisy home learning environment. Now, these things in turn were related to engagement and the time that they spent on home learning. Interestingly, having sufficient internet is actually associated with less engagement. You can think you know, the distraction factor of being able to communicate with your friends all the time seems to be associated with lower engagement with the actual learning materials. But technology and having a noisy environment were associated with engagement and the time spent. If the parents had not been to university, it was their ability and the time they had to supervise that was the primary drivers of the challenges of uh, home learning. So non-graduate parents said that they lacked ability, motivation, confidence, knowledge to supervise their children's home learning. But paradoxically, they had more time to do so, often because they uh, weren't working from home. They might have been furloughed by the government. These things, in turn, strongly related to engagement, the time they spent. Now, girls were unrelated, so gender was unrelated to um, the home learning and parental supervision, but girls were reported being much more engaged with home learning and spending more time home learning. And one thing that always came out in all the analyses we've done is that the parental rating of the quality of the educational provisions that schools offered was very strongly related to how engaged students were and how much time they spent learning. Now, here's the social psychology bit. So we've spoken about these variables already. One of the things we measured was um, this item. So there's a waste of time for people like, and this captures some sort of sense of belonging, a sense of fit, a sense of alienation from the education. Uh, and we wanted to see how this compared, whether it predicted engagement with the materials over and above these other important, more objective factors. So what we found, you know, free school meals associated with home learning, non-graduate parents with parental supervision. We've discussed this already. Free school meal pupils reported feeling more alienated. So did those whose parents had not graduated and so did girls. But eligibility was the strongest related to their feeling alienated. And all of these things predicted how much of the provisions the students used. Um, by far the strongest was provision quality. But then home environment, parental supervision and alienation were all kind of comparable strengths associated with this. And this has important consequences for any catch up plans that the government are using. So if students who are feeling alienated and they don't fit into education are less likely to use the materials, then catch up plans are not going to be used by those who need them. So just to sum up, so there were inequalities in the home learning experience by state independent schools um, based on socioeconomic status and gender. Unfortunately, we don't have sufficient data or power to look at ethnicity or any intersectionality. There were different reasons for those with different challenges. So I guess the takeaway message here is that socioeconomic status is not a unitary thing. Social class is not unitary. There are different indicators of socioeconomic status, particularly free school meals, so economics and education, uh, and support should be tailored to those. The schools have a huge role to play. The provisions are very, very important. And these social identity factors, people like me feeling alienated from education are also vastly important. Um, thank you very much. There's some resources here if you want to follow up this work. Um, but I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew, uh, for the fascinating presentation. Um, I think we will uh, go to the second presenter, who is Noreen Durrani. But everyone else, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box, and we will ask them at the end of all the presentations. Thank you. Noreen, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Del Rabo. Uh, thank you, Matthew, uh, for our Great presentation. There are some similarities um, with the case of Kazakhstan as well. Uh, so I don't know what happened to my PowerPoint slides, but um, 
this in this talk um, i want to uh, draw on two ongoing research projects to focus on the impact of covid-19 on school education in kazakhstan um then Rambo, if you don't mind can we move to the other presentation in the meantime i'll just sort out what the problem is with my powerpoint is that okay? Uh, no problem at all. If colleagues are ready, Emma, Dana, and Mauricio, uh, could you please start if you don't mind? And then Noreen will go through it. Absolutely no problem. But given how closely related these two presentations are, I would suggest we just try to reload it and stick with the original order. Um, okay. So I don't, think, I don't think anybody will mind. We're all used to this by now, Noreen. So maybe okay. try reloading because we could see it like we saw all the slides. Yeah, but it's. I don't know whether it's uh, something to do with time. Maybe um, you can have a short question and answer session, uh, Del Rabo. Yeah, just give me a couple of minutes to sort out what the issue is. Okay, no worries at all. So maybe uh, colleagues have questions for Matthew that we can ask uh, or discuss. I wondered whether, um, given we have. I think a more international audience than base might have for webinars, whether anybody wanted Matthew to break down some of the, the acronyms, some of the proxies which are used in the UK setting to talk about inequalities. I don't, I'm specifically, perhaps somebody wants to type in the chat or ask. Dana, you have raised your hand. Did you want to ask anything? Yes, uh, I was just thinking it's a very interesting presentation. And some of the things that specifically caught my attention were the long period of no education starting in mid-March till June. So how was there any follow-up on how this lost education has been restored, if there was? such an initiative and another question was uh why uh like since there was like this difference uh that the girls were doing better so was there any explanation to that why girls did better academically than boys if i understood correctly Thank you for your questions. I think I missed the first one. So it was about the, the lack of education during that time where there was no provisions. What was the specific? Yes. Yes. Was there any initiative to restore this lost education? So has there been any like additional schedule or something of that sort to now refill the students because then the new year starts and uh, nothing you know, um, yeah. the, the kids seem to have lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, well, there have been suggestions that we just need to reevaluate what our expectations are going to be for this cohort because they have lost such a lot of education. But there have been discussions about that. And they've been implementing some tutoring programs across the UK to try and help students catch up with the learning that they've lost. There's been discussions of longer school days as well. So there's various initiatives, but um, it was suggested a certain amount of money was required in order to uh, in order to really try and counteract some of these detriments and, and erosions to students' education. And the government just did not fund anywhere near it, about 10% of it. So there's an awareness that there are inequalities. There are some catch-up programs that are in place but I don't think any of them are anywhere near sufficient enough to try and close any gaps that have been made because of this lockdown. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And part of that will be re-engaging students and families with the school community and building up that sense of belonging and this lack of alienation. That's gonna be key for any kind of catch up. Um, you mentioned gender as well. So this kind of reflects the national trend. So girls tend to outperform boys in their exam performances in the uh, UK anyway. Um, there's some, uh, so it seems possible that it's to do with different motivation patterns. So girls tend to be more um, 
internally autonomous motivated to learners. Uh, boys tend to need more external it, um, rewards and motivations. And when education is shifted to the home, those external motivations are reduced. So this could be one explanation why we see differences in engagement with boys and girls. But that uh, has not been shown through the data. That's just theoretical. Um, and as we saw, there are no differences in home learning uh, in terms of supervision or home environment, but girls just reported or parents reported that girls were much more engaged. Thank you, Dana, for the very interesting uh, question. Does anyone else wants to ask uh, a question? And then we can move to the second presentation. There's a question in the chat, actually, I think. Um, from Andy answer? Smart, I'm interested to hear about the importance of the engagement of the longing factors, what led you to explore this in the baseline and what questions were asked to whom. Um, so we, this is one of our main aims when we set about doing this because a lot of my work has investigated a sense of belonging at school uh, and at university and a sense of fitting in and that people like you uh, are accepted and are expected to do well or to do badly in education. And these consistently come out as important factors. We've shown work that these social psychological variables, they predict national standardized exams taken at age 16 um, over and above other pupil characteristics, over and above previous exam results. They are very important factors and they're often neglected. Um, so we wanted to measure them and they do seem to be important. And I think they'll be vastly more important as we try and catch up from some of the lost learning. We asked parents um, the alienation question I showed in the presentation, but we also asked them, does your child feel that they fit in at school, um, things like this. Uh, and those questions play an important role in education for sure. Thank you, Matthew. I also see Tijendra uh, raised his hand. Tijendra, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Dilrabo. Um, Thank you, Matthew, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I was just wondering whether you had a breakdown of um, free school meals, uh, children across um, um, ethnic uh, categories, and whether different ethnic uh, groups, children under the free school meal category had different levels of engagements. And also the second part was, um, did you also do qualitative work as part of your project? Uh, what were the people saying to give more kind of uh, uh, extensive explanations to what was happening uh, about your findings? Thank you. Yeah, OK. So um, unfortunately, we don't have sufficient numbers of ethnic minorities with and without free school meals to explore that in our data. There are large differences between different ethnic groups in how impactful free school meals is for attainment. So for some groups, um, free school meals has a large difference and makes a massive difference for attainment, but other groups less so. So it is a really important intersection and it's something that needs to be explored in more detail. Unfortunately, we couldn't do that with our data because we just didn't have enough ethnic minority parents and families who completed uh, the survey. So unfortunately, we're silent on it, but there is definitely large differences and ethnicity and socioeconomic status do interrupt to predict important outcomes. Um, we have not done any qualitative work as part of this study, but my colleagues have, and um, I've been working with them. We've written a chapter together. Um, and it's, yeah, people were saying a lot. It's kind of hard to summarize it in a couple of minutes, but I think they I pointed to some of the things that the teachers were telling us um, about problems with safeguarding. A lot of the parents were very concerned um, about isolation and the social emotional impact that the lockdown was having, especially younger children and children with special educational needs and disabilities. Uh, having said that, some children, so those with um, social anxiety or autism found, um, actually found lockdown to be kind of beneficial for them. They, they didn't have to go to school, they were at home with their parents and reported, parents reported quite positive impact. But the, the other side of that is that them returning to school was seen as a really emotionally hard experience for those people as well. Um, there was a, quite a few parents who were 
thought that the role of schools needed to change as a result of the pandemic, that they needed to be kind of more of a hub of the community. They needed to be organizing communication and helping students throughout this pandemic, not just with education, but through social and emotional development as well. Um, and they really were reconsidering, you know, the role of school in the local communities. That was something that came up quite a lot, which was unexpected. But there is quite a lot more in those um, qualitative interviews um, we can delve into. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all the questions. And Matthew, thank you once again for the uh, very interesting presentation. I think in the interest of time, we will move on to the second presenter. And then if there is time at the end, we will ask more questions of Matthew. Thank you. Noreen, please. Thank you very much. And Apologies. Um, so I, I don't know when I, maybe I just hold it um, with my finger because when I tried it uh, without screen share, um, I would just find. It keeps moving. Um, what do uh, I do? So one suggestion, Maybe. I don't know if uh, Dilrabo, you have access to the presentation yeah. and you can you can manage it from there if it's a problem. If it's a problem with the presentation, then I'm not really sure how to suggest we do it. But why don't you try to- Ricardo, can you please download it and see? Um, I think Dilrabo has access. Okay, if you okay. Can let share me Dilrabo, give it to try. Might... Yeah, okay. thank you. Thanks. Um, I have edited a bit since then, but I hope it should work. So, uh, Noreen, do you want me? Do you want to share your latest slides with me, and I can share that? But, but my latest slides, maybe um, they will behave unruly uh, even on your computer. Yeah. So you can use those slides, and I can speak to th those because something happened while I was editing, yeah? Um, okay, no worries, let me give it a try. So yes, um, uh, my talk is also um, on school education uh, and I draw on, a, on different uh, stakeholders uh, and the context specifically is um, Kazakhstan. So for those of you who are not uh, aware of um, um, the context of school closures in Kazakhstan, um, we had um, um, abrupt decision was made uh, very soon during the pandemic, obviously uh, to secure um, and save lives. But schools were given only three weeks uh, to transition to online schooling. And from the 12th of uh, April, all schools uh, went online amidst pre-existing um, education inequities, uh, which were based largely on uh, region, on school types uh, that Matthew mentioned also in the context of uh, um, the UK, uh, and urban and rural disparities, as well as uh, um, differences between Russian and Kazakh medium schools, raising concerns of equity and social justice. Uh, and particularly because uh, in Kazakhstan, schools operated online um, for a very long time. Um, uh, to be specific, uh, between April 2020 and um, um, August 2021, uh, schools were fully or partially closed for around 77 weeks, uh, which is roughly speaking two academic years. Um, so can we go to the second slide, Dilrabo? Thank you. Uh, Noreen, I haven't been able to share it myself. Just give me a few minutes, please. Okay. All right. It's okay, I'm running it. Just keep going. Noreen, I'm okay. running your slides. Okay, thank you. Um, thank so, you um, yeah. So I, I want to, the focus of my talk is uh, um, just to assess the nature of inequities that emerged uh, and what was the impact of COVID on inequities. And specifically, I'm interested 
in understanding what uh, authorities did to mitigate those inequities and the digital divide. Um, and I'm drawing on two uh, uh, projects. The first one was a qualitative project um, um, uh, drawing on uh, the voices of parents, um, of uh, teachers and of school students uh, with data being collected in um, between December uh, 20 and February 2021 uh, over a course of um, two um, months. Uh, but currently, I have an ongoing project that started with uh, collecting online surveys of school leaders, teachers, and parents. And Matthew shared um, his research instruments, so they were also helpful. And I'm currently completing qualitative case studies of 24 schools in eight regions in Kazakhstan um, to look at issues uh, more holistically. Next slide, please. Ricardo, can we go to the next slide? Delrabo, can you please take me to the next slide? Jack, can you move to the next slide, please? Is that not? Yeah, it's, it should be titled Key Themes. So the fourth one. Yes. Ah. Um, yeah. Thank you. So uh, I want specifically to talk um, about educational inequities in the short term, the impact on quality, uh, how inequities were mitigated, uh, and some of the positive impacts in the long term. But for our international audience, it is important to highlight some key features of education system in Kazakhstan. First of all, education is free. Um, and it is largely delivered through uh, public schools or state schools offering um, um, uh, provision to 96% of uh, students. Um, and then the second important thing is that because of low population density, around 57% of schools are multi-grade or um, ungraded, and these are largely located in rural, rural schools. And the third thing is that there is there exists a very privileged network of schools which select gifted students are highly resourced in terms uh, of material resources as well as human resources. And of these, um, the most uh, prestigious is Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools um, called NIS. Next, please. Is it not working? No, it, it, it's actually not in, um, uh, it's, it, you need to change it to- um, uh, Slideshow. You know, yeah, exactly, slideshow. Probably that's it's, one. It's, it, it is in slideshow on my screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that one, thank you. So what about inequities in the short term? Um, definitely inequities were widened in the short term, uh, but both between mainstream schools and NIS schools, as well as rural schools and uh, urban schools. Um, and um, NIS teachers and students, they both found the transition to online um, um, mode uh, uh, very smooth, like like the UK case, uh, because um, there was meticulous planning, schools were already using digital technologies, uh, teachers' capacity was promptly developed, uh, digital devices were promptly distributed, and extensive IT support was pro provided to families and teachers. By contrast, mainstream schools, particularly those in rural areas, they had to complete the school year um, learning digital schooling, uh, digital, digital teaching on the go. Uh, Jackie, please, uh, next slide. It's very strange. Okay, um, so there were, um, digital inequities between urban and rural areas in access uh, to stable internet and digital devices were uh, significant barriers um, to meaningful access for rural children. Um, 
also particularly rural teachers and those who are older and Kazakhstan has a large number of older teachers nearing retirement for them this transition uh, and the learning curve was specifically very steep. Jack, next slide, please. No. No, this is the same one. Sure. Next slide. Very strange. Yeah, it's moving in my screen, but not on everyone's screen. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, moving to the second theme, uh, uh, quality. Um, Certain subjects were specifically impacted and this came out both from teachers and from students and parents as well. Uh, teaching students in lower primary grades, teaching foundational skills of literacy and numeracy and teaching disciplines which needed a more hands-on experience such as mathematics, sciences and physical education. These were believed to be much more challenging teaching virtually. Uh, for some subjects, parents had to hire a private tuition um, and or they had to spend considerable amount of time learning specific academic content, content in order to help their uh, children. Thank you, um, uh, Jack. Next slide, please. So, um, Yes, concern of, for the use of interactive uh, pedagogies uh, was an issue for uh, teachers and students across the board. Um, because of low bandwidth, students would put their cameras off, uh, depriving teachers of vital visual clues um, in order to see the impact of their teaching uh, on students on the go. Uh, and the challenges of stable internet and access to digital devices were particularly profound in rural areas. Next slide, please. So, of course, uh, effective online schooling requires uh, parental involvement, but not all parents were in a position uh, to do so. While all parents found the shift to distance online uh, education hard, the difficulties were particularly profound for families from low income, parents with limited educational resources and digital connectivity, working parents, single mothers, large families, rural parents, and parents with children in primary grades. Notably, homeschooling was gendered uh, and the responsibility of homeschooling fell more almost exclusively on mothers. Next slide, please. So now moving, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Jack. Next one. I, one. I will talk about this later, next slide, thank you. Um, now I want to talk about my uh, third theme, um, in time, uh, during the long summer break, authorities took substantial measures to mitigate the digital divide. Uh, they distributed a large number of digital resources. For example, uh, our parents reported uh, on average, uh, 85 computers or laptops were distributed across the schools. Likewise, 33% of teachers and 18% of parents reported receiving a laptop from authorities. A large number of teachers were given online training during the summer break. The majority of teachers felt confident that now they can teach uh, um, effectively online, although male teachers uh, were slightly more confident than female teachers. Uh, thanks, Jack. Next slide, please. And finally, it's not all um, uh, uh, gloom. Uh, gloomy situation. There are some positive outcomes emerging in the long term, both for the schools and for stakeholders. Uh, schools now have far away resources than they had pre-COVID, uh, and the ratio of child to a computer has uh, improved substantially. Uh, next slide, please. Across uh, the board, um, stakeholders reported improved literacy skills. This was true for teachers, for parents, um, and for students. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so an additional advantage uh, was also, um, and this again reported both by parents, teachers, and students themselves, that students were now taking more responsibility for their learning and uh, their reliance on teachers uh, was de decreasing even when schools have now reopened. Uh, they try uh, to solve um, their problems uh, uh, on their own. However, a very positive impact has been strong uh, um, partnerships between home and schools. Um, oh, on the whole, uh, parents uh, participated um, they were involved in uh, during the homeschooling and schools also supported parents uh, in helping their children homeschool. Okay. So next slide, please. Uh, so now, what is the situation uh, on, on, on students learning um, that Matthew was earlier um, talking about? Uh, while Jack is transitioning to the next slide, the most important thing coming out from our um, context is that across the board stakeholders are questioning uh, the reliability of assessment data and they believe that parents completed assessment tasks for students and students colluded uh, or plagiarized uh, so implying that um, it's hard to estimate the learning uh, loss um, jack can we move to the next slide please So when we asked uh, parents about um, the one before, so just the one before conclusion, because there are statistics, so it's, it's good um, uh, if the audience can um, uh, see it. So when we asked parents, uh, uh, how has their um, children's uh, learning been uh, impacted? So although there are slight variations across the grades, um, the one in two parents believe their children learning has been worse off uh, compared uh, to pre-pandemic. So just to conclude, um, although inequity in access to quality education widened in the immediate aftermath of the school closures over time, authorities in Kazakhstan took substantial measures to mitigate the digital divide. Now, Nevertheless, poor internet connectivity was a significant factor in limiting the quality of education. Um, and mostly teachers and students, particularly in rural areas, they just resorted to the use of smartphone and WhatsApp uh, for uh, learning and teaching. However, there have also been positive outcomes on schools and students in the long run. Um, how Ever, the learning of particular groups of students and um, subjects was more uh, profoundly affected. And um, there is a question of reliability of assessment and how can we uh, think about assessment uh, which um, um, can produce reliable estimates, uh, particular, particularly in the long uh, uh, term uh, would be useful. I just wanted to say I'm thankful, I, I'll end, here, but I'm thankful to uh, my funders, uh, um, Partnerships for Equity and Inclusion and Nazarbayev University for fund funding the two projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noreen, for another interesting uh, presentation. I think we will, uh, uh, if you have any questions, we can ask them uh, at the end of uh, the third uh, presentation. But for now, I will pass it over to Emma, Mauricio, and Dana. Okay, thanks, Dilrabo, and thank you very much to the two previous presenters for the, you know, the detailed examinations that they've done looking at school learning. What we're going to do now um, is two things slightly different. So first, we're going to switch to higher education um, away from compulsory education. And second, we're going to kind of zoom out and take more of a global view. So Mariso is going to share the slide. So I think if we can put it on um, full screen mode that will be helpful for people to see these slides in a little bit bigger detail um, so whilst we're doing that I'll just say thank you very much to base for the uh, invitation to join the webinar today we're thrilled to have the opportunity um, i'm emma sabzalia i'm head of research and foresight at unesco's international institute for higher education in latin america and the caribbean as mentioned i'm joined by my colleagues dana brashava 
and Mauricio Escribens. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the work that we've done looking at the impact of COVID on higher education over the past couple of years um, and give you some snapshots from a recent report that we published. First, though, um, let me just, if I may, take a, just a couple of moments to say a few words about our institute, because I think everybody is familiar with UNESCO, but perhaps not with our institute. We use our Spanish language acronym ESALC. Uh, because our institute is actually based in Venezuela, although the three of us, and in fact, all of the research and analysis team works remotely. So in fact, none of us are in Venezuela, but our institute is, the core team is there. Uh, the institute works bilingually in English and Spanish. Um, and we have been since our founding in 1997, we're the only specialized institute in the entire United Nations family which has a mission to support higher education improvement. So we have this kind of solid foundation in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, but our work, as you'll see from what we're going to discuss today, is increasingly global um, and international and comparative in scope. So you see on screen here our four current strategic directions. All of those are under the heading of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, particularly SDG number four on quality education. So. Our work is to promote the universal right to higher education. We work to empower institutions and higher education systems to be more responsive, inclusive, relevant, and efficient. We work to nurture innovation in higher education, and we work to re-envision internationalization. A lot of our research work crosses all of these strategic directions in some way or another. So that's just a couple of words about us. Next slide, please. So today we're going to talk just very briefly about the work that we've done on tracking the pandemic and global perspective from that higher education uh, level. And you see on the right uh, the report that we published earlier this year, which summarizes the results. And the QR code, if you want to scan it, will take you directly to uh, our webpage where you can find the report and the other work that we've been doing over the last couple of years on COVID. So as I mentioned, the report is global. Uh, we've been able to track the experiences of higher education institutions, systems, and even sort of individual stakeholders in higher education in over 40 countries in all world regions. It's comprehensive. The report is organized first by the kind of different functions of higher education. So we look at teaching, we look at research, we look at administration and management, and we also take up internationalization, which we're actually not going to talk about in the presentation today because we simply don't have time, but it's a very important part of the report as well. And you can imagine, and with the pandemic impact on travel, why uh, that is such an important topic for us to take up. Uh, the report is fully evidence-based. We used around 200 sources in, mul in multiple languages to create the evidence base. Um, and it's also action oriented. So it's not simply about presenting the experiences and the impact of COVID, but it summarizes some key takeaways from the evidence and we offer some observations for future action. So I'm going to let uh, Mauricio and Dana tell you more about some of the findings from the report. So I'll hand over now to Mauricio, thank you. Thank you, Emma. So the massive closures of the physical campus were probably the most evident impact of the COVID-19 pandemic because it forced institutions to rethink how they deliver their teaching and learning processes. Um, although we are well aware that most institutions were completely unprepared to face the pandemic, it must be noted that more than half of them um, moved to online environments very quickly, just within a matter of months. And by early 2021, the hybrid teaching and learning mode was the most popular way to secure the pedagogical continuity. So at the ESOC, we have been closely tracking the closures as well as the reopening of universities in Latin America and the Caribbean. And as you can see in the map, by December 2021, most higher education systems in the region were at least partially open and had an important degree of hybrid delivery. And here, um, as most of you probably know, the pandemic also carried uh, an important economic recession worldwide. 
and that's reflected in the concerns of students. Uh, surveys in Japan and also in the European Union show that roughly a third of the students faced financial difficulties during the pandemic. And those figures increase to half of the respondents in countries like Nepal. So overall, there was a tighter economic condition that forced both government and institutions to support students financially in order to avoid the important risk of massive um, dropout rates. And maybe following a bit on Matthew's presentation, um, the mental health issues were also a rising problem leading to high levels of anxiety, depression, and stress among both students and the staff. And to deal with the impact of the lockdowns and social isolation, um, some professors introduced new dynamics like starting their class with a song, a brief meditation exercise, or simply adding an online whiteboard feature uh, where students could simply write down their concerns, their state of mind, and in general, what they were thinking during the time of the pandemic. And at an institutional level, discontinued mental health support programs were reactivated. That was the case of the Catholic University of Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. And other institutions like the Beijing Normal University approached the mental health component at a much broader scale, um, offering um, support services to the entire population by leveraging their alumni network as volunteers. In terms of research, um, new barriers to access and also to produce new knowledge had to be faced. For example, over half of the fieldwork activities which in many cases are key components of research projects were either canceled or suspended um, due to the lockdowns. Access to specialized equipment and labs was also considerably reduced. And both impacts are reflected in a Pan-African survey showing that more than 70% of researchers faced at least one of those consequences of the pandemic. Also, travel bans implied that international conferences had to move online, changing the way that we used to disseminate information and knowledge. And overall, the academic staff claimed that they had less time to invest in research because they were prioritizing the shift to um, online environments. So the teaching and learning component in terms of time allocation was prioritized for teachers. Now, it's important to stress that the emergency cuts through various areas of institutional activities. But in the early stages of the pandemic, it became evident that crisis management was going to be a key component to adapt to the crisis. So under an ideal scenario, an institution would go through the seven phases that you see in the graph. They will first prepare, plan, and train um, the academic community identify potential areas of risk. When the crisis arises, they will activate their response plans. And during the emergency, they will be constantly communicating. Once the emergency is over, they tend to evaluate how the response emergency plan um, performed uh, to take lessons learned and adapt it for future crisis. But the pandemic showed us that this process tends to be a, a very rare practice and explains why, or at least partially why, so many institutions were unprepared. And a lot of the universities and the evidence that we gathered shows that these emergency plans uh, were developed and improvised in the early stages of the pandemic once the COVID-19 forced institutions to close the physical campus. And now I will open the floor to my colleague, Dana Prasheva. Uh, she will tell you about the key takeaways of the report. Thank you, Mauricio. 
Uh, yes, based on this extensive immersion in global academic experiences under COVID-19, uh, our team is happy to present these key takeaways. The first of which is about the hybrid education and that has already been, I think, implied in our previous presentations when we were talking about the education losses and how education needs education overall and higher education in particular has to uh, adapt to this new hybrid teaching and learning mode. So in this way, we're talking about the uh, new opportunities that um, emerged to explore these platforms and various innovative tools for this hybrid teaching and learning. It's also um, like we have also found that COVID-19 response uh, has given us this ability to shift to online learning very fast. And it has shown to universities that it is possible to do that very fast. Uh, we're also talking about the online teaching, yes, but it's also evident that this online teaching and learning cannot replace the in-person um, learning for learning experiences for students. And uh, the last idea that we're um, listing here in terms of the hybrid teaching and learning is about the training of the instructors and um, teaching them how to use the technology properly. This has already been mentioned before. And here we're giving you an example of Peru where four and a half million was uh, invested by the government to teach uh, 5,000 faculty members and 15,000 students to learn how to use these digital platforms, create digital learning content, and so on and so forth. Um, when we're talking about research, we need to uh, keep in mind these three uh, core ideas. Uh, the first of which is the science needs to stay at the heart of the decision-making, which when we're thinking about the pandemic, again, uh, on the example of Sri Lanka, there was a presidential task force that, um, and advisory committee that were organized around these uh, responses, the national institutional responses to COVID. And that has been a really crucial uh, step for to maintain and ensure public health. Another point uh, on research is the need to incorporate principles of open science. And a very good example comes from JSTOR Digital Library that has given an unlimited access to uh, their higher education institutions who have had the membership before, but they did not have the wide access possibilities. So the JSTOR has given this um, access to the universities up until the end of the June 2022. In addition to that, they have also given a free, um, they extended the access to the articles for general public from six articles per month to 100 articles per month. And the last point on research is about funding, where we're talking about uh, equal distribution of funding for different areas. For example, when we're thinking about COVID research, we have noticed that the prioritization of the funding has shifted, um, as a result of which some other areas have received less funding than uh, the COVID related research. For example, the research on cancer um, that was in as a case from the National Institute for Health Research that has received an additional funding, uh, but the uh, Cancer Research UK has experienced the reduced funding for their uh, core research activities. And when we're talking about institutional responses, we need to remember about the institutional resilience. Uh, here we have 
two main points. Um, the first of which is that higher education institutions need to be more resilient in the terms of uh, incorporating this risk management um, practices into their institutional activities. And the contingency plans need to be need to become a new normal for the universities. And here we uh, have found this interesting experience from Singapore, where they, after they have already experienced previous pandemics, the government decided they have seen that the uh, that the universities are unprepared for uh, teaching under these restrictive uh, conditions. So they have, um, uh, like they have at the institutional, at uh, the national level, uh, given the universities this uh, this requirement that each institution needs to have these risk management or contingency planning uh, in in their institutional activities, and that has helped universities in Singapore be better prepared to respond to the pandemic. And in addition, the university, um, the National University of Singapore has, went, uh, has gone even further by developing this app, which has helped you to track where um, the density of people throughout the campus. And the second two points are about mental health. As Mauricio has already mentioned, this is um, an emerging topic now in throughout the education. Uh, so in the higher education premises, we have seen that institutional policies need to consider the emotional climate of the university and the mental health of higher education stakeholders need to stay as a priority of these institutional activities. Uh, here, an example uh, comes from South Africa where an institutional leader has shown on her example, how to address this uh, mental health issues by starting her meetings, online meetings, from asking from her team uh, how their well being was, or she would ask their loved ones well being and health. And that has shown a really, uh, that has connected the team uh, with one another while staying physically apart. And now over to you, Emma. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Sandana. Um, given the very small amount of time we have today, you'll understand, colleagues, that we can only give you a very small, you know, preview really of some of the findings uh, from the the report. So we would encourage you, and I'll show the QR code again in a moment, so that if you want, you can access the full report. So because we're now at a point where we're we're more than two years into the pandemic and whatever anybody says that this pandemic is over, I'm afraid it's not, we're still there with it, but we're at a different stage for sure. So at this point, let me wrap up by giving you kind of four thoughts about where do we go from here? So the question we ask in the report is resuming or reforming? Are we seeing this period as one in which there will be fundamental shifts in the way that higher education is organized, the way that it's financed, the way that it's governed and so on? Or are we just seeing that this was kind of a perhaps a unique window and in fact we'll see a return? So four things that we'll leave you with today. So first, um, what we've seen in terms of enrollment rates uh, for 2021 and now we, we don't quite have the data yet. So this you know current academic year, but what we have seen um, with the stabilization of enrollment patterns is in general and the rapid return by most institutions to in-person teaching and learning. So that suggests to us that there isn't gonna be a fundamental transformation in this core understanding that higher education is a face-to-face -face endeavor, right? So for all the online learning that we have and this talk about hybridity, fundamentally, just like I think we're seeing with the evidence from schooling, there's no shift in the idea that schooling or higher education happens in person. Second, we're also seeing uh, the resumption of academic related travel. Um, that also to us points to the return of pre-pandemic practices when it comes to aspects of internationalization like academic mobility. Third, um, we would hope or we would expect and already seeing actually and I think the previous presentations may also kind of point in this direction 
that some of the digitalization practices that were introduced or expanded during the pandemic, like, for example, training on digital skills, pedagogies, um, permitting hybrid or remote working for staff, creating updating policies on the use of technology and so on, those are likely to remain. So we may see some shift as a result of this kind of digitalization to use the broad term. Finally, um, and again, this is, you know, we're, we're not the first to say this, but the pandemic has, has absolutely shone a spotlight on inequalities that already existed in higher education. Um, it hasn't created so much as shown us what's already there um, across our systems, within our systems. So whether we're talking about the differential treatment of students based on their background, closed access to knowledge and research results, unevenness in global patterns of research collaboration, lack of access even to the basic requirements for digitalization, so electricity, internet access, uh, not having enough devices, all of these inequalities still exist. And I think this is a call for all of us who are working in education and higher education to make sure that these are kept at the forefront. So that's where we'll wrap up for today. Um, as I mentioned, we have the final slide with the, um, just show you just the QR code again, to thank you for your time. And we look forward to your, to your questions and to continuing the discussion. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Emma, Dana, and Mauricio for another uh, interesting presentation. I think in the interest of time, I will uh, hand it over to our discussant, Ricardo, who will provide uh, his thoughts briefly on all three presentations, and then we will open the floor for Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be your discussant, and thank you for giving me this time. Uh, I think all three presentations highlight the issues that we all phase during the pandemic, we were embedded within, you know, when this happened in, in all our organizations and in the way that we operated. Uh, many of us and many colleagues from the Global South joined join up our efforts to understand what was happening in the class, well, outside of the classrooms, in, in the homes, how different families were uh, coping with the pandemic at different levels of education. So, Today, we didn't touch on the early, early years, but that was another aspect of uh, child development that was very important, which also took place during the pandemic as many uh, early child providers closed also their, their uh, uh, provision. And then we go all the way to higher education and globally to see what, what is the state of play today. And what I'm taking also is that I maybe seeing this with a little bit of a glass half full Sometimes I tend to be made maybe a little bit more positive about what the, the whole issue that is there. So first of all, we have now the ability of being all here together and discussing from, you know, colleagues who are supposedly sitting in Venezuela, but they're just scattered from, throughout the world. And uh, Noreen, who's in um, Nazabayan and Dil Bravo, you're in Kazakhstan, wrote in, in a different institution and is bringing us together to be able to have these conversations and also bringing the knowledge together. And we have also improved our way in which we use digital devices and access to resources. So many colleagues now, for example, uh, in, in, in Africa uh, as a continent, we have, have put together and supported the African Education Research Database. And this is for us to get access, much closer access to the scholarship that is emerging from our colleagues from Africa. And I'm sure that there's also colleagues from Southeast Asia and Latin America who are also having these collectives in terms of bringing knowledge to the forefront. So yeah, knowledge is there. Knowledge is bringing us closer to what we can learn. And the questions that I have is in this that just remain for me and maybe the, the participants can uh, have thoughts. And I will have to go because unfortunately I'm in exam board. Uh, so sorry about my disappearance, but it's what Noreen pointed out that there is now some sort of changes in the accountability relations that happened during the pandemic. The parents taking much active role and our research with Pratham, uh, the largest NGO in India, and their forefront research with parents and communities showing how these parents were absolutely central to continue to support learning. And then we ask learning, what, what kind of learning? And I think that's another question that we're all asking. Uh, Ma uh, Matthew is talking about the psychosocial aspects of of education. Uh, we also have uh, 
different ki kinds of literacy and numeracy skills, but there are other things that these children were learning. And we, as a researchers, we only tend to observe and capture and and uh, and and quantify certain types of learning, but that doesn't mean that these children were not learning. So these accountability relations change, and then there seems to be strengthening within the school. And that's really interesting as, as something that uh, I think, Noreen, you were uh, pointing out, and it would be really important to, to understand more of, of these uh, new patterns that are emerging. So from there, I just leave you with a huge thank you for you know continuing to, to join up together into this uh you know journey that we're having and thank you to many funding institutions you thank a number of them who at, at the moment of the pandemic really threw out resources to us as researchers uh you know in the global north and south to be able to to work together to understand these issues and to be able to support children and young people as they transit their learning uh, trajectories during the pandemic so i will really have to go because uh our colleague Oscar Valiente, who's also uh, uh, a, a dear friend from uh, that you all know, and he's in Compare Editor. He's waiting for me next time board in Glasgow. So I really want to thank you all for giving me this invitation and hope to uh, listen to the end of the conversations uh, on the recording. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Okay, I think I will now uh, open the floor for Q&A, but uh, before we ask others their question, Noreen and other colleagues, do you want to comment on the issues mentioned by Ricardo? Do you want to address any of the comments that he made? I, I might just go ahead uh, with the issue of uh, learning and uh, you know what are children learning. Um, so from our um, from our study and our uh, discussions with students, um, it wasn't uh, learning that children were concerned most about. Um, um, what they really missed about school was the social environment. Uh, and the ability to interact uh, with their peers. Um, and that indirectly then impacted uh, on their uh, learning and motivation. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, even some very good students uh, who were in academic terms working quite okay. Uh, it was, uh, again, like Matthew mentioned, it was the social side uh, of life in the schools uh, that children were more uh, most concerned uh, about in our study. Thank Maybe you, Noreen. I, and, uh -huh. I see a question. Matthew, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted, so Ricardo was talking about parents' active role in education. And I think that's a really important point. There were many parents who were heavily involved but I think it's also important to recognize the stress that parents were under during the lockdown and how unequally distributed that was as well. I think parents who had children with special educational needs and disabilities or who were vulnerable really, really struggled during the lockdown. And despite best intentions, they probably wanted to be involved, but it's very difficult to be involved under those highly stressful circumstances. So I think if we want the relationship between schools and parents to change, we need to support those parents who are really struggling with it more than others, because I think there was a big inequalities there as well. Um, but when parents do get involved, we know it has hugely beneficial consequences. So I think that is the right area, one of the right areas to be focused on. Thank you, Matthew. I'm Dana or Mauricio. Do you want to address any of the comments by uh, Ricardo? I would kind of simply sort of point out, if I may, um, back in 2019, before we knew that this pandemic was going to reach us, um, UNESCO launched a major initiative on the futures of education, which had as its aim to kind of really rethink how we organize education and how we conceptualize what is education. Then the pandemic comes along and of course it's made an indelible impact on the way that that initiative has unfolded. 
But over the course of a couple of years, UNESCO was able to engage over a million people around the world, think together about the futures of education. Our institute, for example, made a contribution to that by looking at the futures of higher education. But I'm just mentioning it because some of the comments that Ricardo just made now about accountability, what are children learning, really resonated in the context of that thinking. Because if this isn't the moment for us to stop and say, what is it that we want to achieve with education? I don't know when it is. And I know Ricardo says, you know, let's try to take this kind of glass half full and think about the innovations which have come, think about the opportunities that children who, for example, you know, perhaps don't flourish in a formal school environment have had being in a different kind of learning environment. At the same time, I think we still are faced with these, you know, many inequities and challenges going forward. Um, I'll put a link in the chat, uh, if you don't mind, to the Futures of Education initiative. There's a huge report that came from that. Uh, it was published um, in November 2021. But I think for colleagues who work at any kind of level on education, it's a really kind of inspiring, exciting, sort of mind opening way of thinking about some of the issues that we work on, whether at micro, meso or macro level in different ways. So I'm really glad that Ricardo was kind of able to draw from the, the three different presentations today and see uh, some of those threads as well. Uh, thank you all for, for your responses. I see a question for uh, Noreen from Vanessa in the chat. Uh, Noreen, the question is, other than rural urban gap, uh, what were the, uh, what is it? Who did your research find as the groups lagging behind, other than the rural and urban gap? Yes, thanks uh, for the question, Vanessa. So apart from the rural and urban gap, um, I think, although we didn't have a huge uh, number of uh, participants, but these were predominantly uh, um, children with disabilities. Uh, they were totally lost and parents didn't know um, how, how to help them. Um, um, so that's the top, although we don't have a huge number of participants who acknowledge uh, that they have a child uh, with disability. Um, uh, these, the next one uh, were when uh, cases where both parents were working and in blue collar jobs. So, um, you know, in most cases, as Ricardo mentioned, um, work moved uh, to home as well. Uh, but there were certainly people who needed to be on site working in factories or in hospitals. Um, and these were the children of those people where both parents, children were totally unsupervised. Uh, teachers were saying they had to call parents and they were at work because children were not turning up uh, for anything or sometimes uh, going also to you know, home visits um, uh, as well. Uh, so these, these were uh, the ones we, um, for the for the numerical, um, you know, the survey question on uh, self perceptions of how worse the learning was. At this point, we only have analyzed um, responses by different grades, uh, but we we do have data on parents' um, income levels um, and uh, ethnicity uh, as well. We can look at that. Uh, but another group of uh, children um, who found it hard were. Um, children in Kazakh medium schools. Uh, and as um, some of you might know, parents that themselves might not be very competent in Kazakh language, but uh, because Kazakh is a national language, they, they send their children to Kazakh medium schools. So these parents were not in a position uh, to support uh, their children. And particularly when children were very young, they needed someone to provide them that hands-on uh, support. Thank you. Thank you, Noreen. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vanessa, for the interesting question. We have about five minutes left. So any other questions from other colleagues to any of the presenters? Please raise your hand. Uh, Tijendra? Yeah, I was hesitating to raise my hand because I've already spoken. But um, um, yeah, if I may, I think... Um, it's really interesting um, to, to listen to all the colleagues uh, 
uh, about their um, great research. Um, something that colleagues from UNESCO presented about this resuming or reforming is quite significant. Um, so one point I see there is that uh, the, the universities in the UK um, are, are wanting students to be on campus because there's also this financial motivation for universities and then we're being encouraged to go back to the normal sort of lecture style delivery, uh, you know, which is quite disappointing having really developed uh, uh, fantastic online resources and online model of delivery in the past. Um, so, so there is that sort of political economy involved in that process where this change is being kind of undermined um, uh, institutionally, uh, at, at least in the, in the UK. Uh, but uh, I think we, we, we should be looking out for more research where what are the legacies, um, the positive um, impact of uh, you know, online education that we have generated and how that can be institutionalized in the in the higher education um, sector. Uh, I think that that's that's the thing that we need to be pushing and as UNESCO and other institutions, we should be um, sort of uh, encouraging governments to 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 make use of that. And while at the same time addressing the issue of potential inequalities that uh, those kinds of models could generate um, and who is out of the provision and who is benefiting more as, as Matthew's presentation quite uh, you know, explicitly demonstrated that the children from the private schools were obviously benefiting more from the provision of online education because they had the resources and the parents were more educated and there was you know, money involved in that as well. But I think the final point for me is um, what is it that we can learn from doing research during the pandemic. So what are the methodological implications for us? I think that's where not much has been uh, done and, and discussed. And that is the area that we probably need to pay more attention. What are the ethical dilemmas around doing research during the pandemic? Many people talk about doing research online actually reduces the risk, but also in some contexts, there may be more risks of doing online research, the pressures created on the participants on the other side that you have no idea what kind of environments they're based in. For example, you know, gender related research, you know, women being interviewed during the, in, in the families. So I think uh, there are ethical and methodological lessons learned from these kinds of projects. Um, if we had more time, we would definitely discuss uh, around that. But I, <clears throat> I was just thinking about those issues as, as uh, colleagues were presenting. Uh, thank you, Tajendra, for the very thoughtful uh, observations. I wonder if anyone wants to comment. I know we are running out of time, but maybe one or two minutes to, uh, and the presenters just comment and address that. Emma, please. Emma, those fantastic comments, questions. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure where to start because I want to say lots of things about all of them and I won't. Um, but I will perhaps back speaking to your first point um, on what comes next, uh, as I understood it. So I would highlight, for example, uh, we gave the example from the Peruvian government, which made this massive investment in um, upskilling teachers and students. So I'm pleased to say that that work from the Peruvian government side is continuing and our institute um, from, you know, from UNESCO is able to support that as they move forward. So that is one way I think in which UNESCO is, is continuing um, to support education. Uh, in this case, that would be higher education specifically on this kind of digitalization. It's an area of work which our Institute is increasingly focusing on recognizing exactly your point. You know, How do we harness some of these innovations that we've seen during the pandemic equally what steps need to be taken, you know, from a technical perspective, from a research perspective, from an analytical perspective to support governments, institutions, students, faculties around the world to be prepared and to be and to, to overcome some of these inequities that exist. Final thing I'll just briefly say is I completely agree and we could give you plenty of examples that we've seen from our work about some of the ethical dimensions of doing research during this kind of pandemic period. It also extends to teaching as well. So when we're thinking about the kind of situation that we find our students in or our teachers in, I think it's equally important to consider the ethics around that too, not just the ethics, but kind of the well-being aspects which have been brought up 
in the other presentations. I'll stop there because I think we're out of time. But thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who's joined today. This has been really been interesting to be able to bring together the different bits of research and kind of share the key findings with you all. Thank you, Emma. Noreen and Matthew, do you want to say something briefly on uh, Dejendra's uh, comments? Thank you. So very briefly, Dejendra, um, thanks for those comments. Uh, absolutely agree with them. Uh, on the issue of ethics, I think um, uh, uh, one observation is that those who were the most marginalized, they couldn't be actually accessed uh, via online technologies. Uh, and um, it's across uh, all kinds of stakeholders, um, um, particularly vulnerable groups and uh, children voices was very hard to tap into. Uh, using digital uh, technologies. And, and the, the most important thing for us, I think, is how to keep um, uh, the positive aspects. Uh, you know, I myself am losing now some of the digital skills that I learned um, um, because we also taught two academic years teaching online. Um, so how to um, keep those skills um, uh, because we we don't know if we may still uh, need those, but there were some um, very positive things, like, for example, the kind of flexibility schools offered families uh, in those circumstances. And now I, I guess schools are back to normal, those rigid regulations in terms of time, uh, submission of work. So, for example, teachers, um, many teachers pointed out that late um, slow students actually have blossomed. Uh, during online learning because they are no longer required to complete things on time. They have more time. So those kind of things in the context of Kazakhstan, for example, schools uh, do three shifts because school buildings um, um, are not sufficient. So how can we use then blended learning? Um, because for some subjects, blended learning can be done very well, um, while for others uh, in, on uh, um, site learning might be more important. So how do we do some saving around uh, our contextual realities? Because there were some very good um, uh, learning emerging uh, out of online learning as well and how to keep those uh, and not to start business as usual. Thank you very much, Noreen. Matthew? Thanks, yeah, I'll just make one point I think is that I do think that there are certain innovations that are worth keeping and really worked well from a kind of inclusivity perspective. It allowed students with diverse learning approaches that perhaps weren't catered for before to get more involved in education. But at the same time, that comes with its own problems around inequality and the digital divide, for instance. So we need to bear kind of a broader perspective when we're trying to conceptualize how to move forward about inclusivity, but also inequalities and how those two things interact with each other. Um, we are now running out of time. I just want to sincerely thank all of our presenters for their fascinating presentations and for their very thoughtful contribution that helped all of us. I also want to thank everyone who joined today. Um, our next webinar will be on decolonization of education, which is planned sometime in February. And we already have two presenters uh, who confirmed, and these are Riyad Shahjan from Michigan State University and Carolina Guzman from uh, Tarapaca University in Chile. And we still have a third presenter to confirm, but thank you all for joining us today. And we are very much looking forward uh, to see you at our next webinar. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Dilra and Jack, for putting together this wonderful event today. Thank you, Tijendra. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, everyone.